Hi, welcome to Indie ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Brian Hoyland, and I had him on in December, if you want to go back and see that. But today we're having a whole new conversation. And I wanted to start it out, Brian, with um, what did you think about near-death experiences before you had one? Well, I was a, I was a doubter. I, I didn't believe in them at all. I, you know, I, I to my to my kind of shame almost at this point, you know, having experienced one, I I wasn't very very kind about it. I I really didn't believe that these things could happen. I I, w- I didn't think people were lying. I I thought it was you know a physiological reaction, you know, neurotransmitters firing a little bit too much too fast. Um, you know, I thought it was just this release of neurochemicals that was happening, you know, upon death. I've since learned that that's that's impossible to happen. You know, I, I there's a lot of theories out there in the psycho- psychological field. And, you know, I wanted to go with the ones that were were theoretically towards science, not towards spirituality. And, you know, I, I realized that there was such a disregard for the spiritual side. Some of the people in the medical field are very biased. I um, mean, that's just that's just a fact that if they can't explain it, they they don't want to even acknowledge it. So they'll but they'll come up with a lot of theories that they also can't explain, but they have a, a an idea of some sort of material concept behind it. And that's that's the real problem, because when I when I died, all my all my material body died. And so when I was you know on the other side, I didn't have emotions. My emotions were completely gone. It, I felt love, but it wasn't coming from me. It was coming from God. So it was it was totally different than anything I could have ever expected. Because if my brain was still going, I wouldn't. I would still have emotions. I would still have the certain physiological concepts that that we have here. I uh, I didn't hear anything. My hearing was gone. I didn't have ears to hear. But everything was intellectual. So the things that I did here was intellectually transmitted into my soul. You know, so, so it's it was something that was just so wonderful to be able to, to see from a science standpoint because I love science. But I uh, I was really blown away by how everything leading up to my death it was so traumatic. I mean, I had one of the worst deaths you could ever imagine. It was seven hours of just suffering after being in chronic end stage heart failure for five months so I mean I was already dying several times you know before that but this one where I was actually in the active process of dying for cardiac arrest it was it was brutal my my body was shutting down all my organs were 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 closing off so I couldn't breathe it felt like I was being suffocated my blood wasn't flowing so all my my cells in my body were screaming in agonies you know please give us some blood but but none of that was happening. And so I remembered that whole, that whole process of dying. I, I remembered my death, didn't have any kind of close off where, you know, it stopped. And then all of a sudden, you know, here I am somewhere else, you know, later, my, my conscious thought didn't go away. But what did happen is I had just all of a sudden a, a burst of, of intelligence. You know, my intelligence increased when I was connected with God. And, and it was so far beyond what, what a human being could ever even think of. I can't even explain it at this point. You know, I, I don't think an angel could come down here and tell you exactly what it was that I was experiencing because our human minds just can't grasp what it, what it was that I, I was now experiencing. And I had a whole memory of, of my experience while I was dead. And then coming back, I went back into my body And as soon as I got back into my physical body, that intelligence went away, but I spontaneously revived. So my body, as soon as I was into it, I was able to operate my body once again, but there was no break in my conscious thought from, from any, at any point of it. So that was, that was just really wonderful for me to see this, how, how, when we do die, we, we, our, our soul continues to live. It doesn't die. Our bodies die. Do you think there's a difference in our memory right now of us talking and remember it tomorrow than our when we don't have that brain in that body and we're in just our consciousness, just in our soul, that memory that it holds of what happened there? I absolutely that's a great question because my memory before dying, you know, like some of the things in the emergency room, I remember a lot of it. I don't remember everything. There's gaps. There's things that I can't even 
I can't even think about now that are just, you know, it's like, I know it's sort of it happened, but you know, I, I, I don't really have a great strong memory of it because there was, it was hard to, to detail that, <clears throat> but in heaven, my memory is crystal clear. I, I mean, I can sit there and I do often, I sit back and think about it because it's so wonderful, you know, and then coming back again, after I had died, you know, I, I had all these emotions while I was in my body before and after, you know, coming back, I, I was excited. I was happy. I had this wonderful experience, but you know, I had no clue how long I would live. I, the doctors were certainly up in the air. They're like, we don't have an idea of how, how long you're going to live. We couldn't even give you a guess, but, all of that, there's gaps, you know, in real life, there were gaps in my memory, just like all of us have, we all experience that where certain things take our attention, but a lot of it just falls away. But in heaven, what I focused on is crystal clear. It's just a, a, a solid memory. And it's better than any memory that I have of, of anything else in my life, no matter how much emotion is attached to it and caused me to really lay it down strongly as a memory still doesn't compare to what I experienced in heaven. I kind of think of it as like entombed in this golden egg or something, these memories. They're just like encased and like on this silver platter, you know, it's just preserved. We were yeah. talking about canning before we got started. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like they're preserved in this yeah. and they, yeah. they don't go bad. No, they don't go bad. It's, it, and that's the thing that I think is, is wonderful when we, when we realize that, when we die, everything is better than what it is when we're alive. You know, I'm, I'm no longer afraid of death. You know, it's, it, it almost, <clears throat> it almost kind of turns some people off. My, my wife kind of gets a little uneasy about it, but how easy it would be for me to die again. <clears throat> you know, I, I chose to come back, but I, I only did that because of how much God loved me. I didn't, I didn't come back because I, I wanted to still experience life and hold on to that, that, that dearness that we have, you know, for our lives, I really couldn't care less about my life anymore. Not in a sick way, not in a, you know, a, a, uh, even not even in a sad way. It's just that I wanted to do more for God because of how much he loves us. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. When you see God, you realize that how much he loves us, it, you're willing to do anything for him. And so now when I look at death, it's like, well, I, I really honestly can't wait for it to happen. However, I know it's just like with everybody else until it's my time. I, I don't have a say in, in that, you know, it's, it's up to him. When right. And we have families, you know, we have yeah. responsibilities, we yeah. have earthly things, you know, we're yeah, not done yet. Those things. Yeah. It's, and it's, and that's good to enjoy them. It's, it's wonderful too. And, we, and, you know, I think God wants us to enjoy them to the fullest while we're here, mm -hmm. but in the proper order, you know, I, I know I loved my family before I died, but I love them way more now. And it's because I put God first. I have everything properly ordered now. And when I when I do that, God wants me to dedicate myself to my family and fulfill every single duty I have to them. And if I don't do that, then I'm not serving God well. And it's the same thing with my work. You know, I work with homeless and he wants me to do that in order. I put him first and I bend over backwards then for the homeless because I know how much he loves them. And it puts everything right. And you know, these, these guys who are, are homeless, they love working with me because they know that I can. Hey, Jim, care. will you close that window? I'm sorry, the dog's barking. I don't want to interrupt you. Problem. Yeah, no, not a problem. No, but it's it's wonderful to, to, to work with, the, with those those people that that sometimes are a bit of a challenge, but you put God first and you see how everything unfolds. And even people who are a challenge start to learn to love you because of how much they feel you love them. <clears throat> and your health what's it like right now i mean what's your prognosis well you know that it's it's up in the air um you know i was telling you a little bit about how covid kind of changed everything you know that my the the staff has to dedicate certain percentage of their staff to to working with covid related issues so there's a real drain on the hospital system and with that there's there's just not enough appointments to to keep things regular you know even even my first yearly checkup that it happened right at, at COVID, so they had to push it back several months so i had to go without being checked for several months when you know it was a real dire time to, to make sure you check to make you know with the rejection and all the other things that can go wrong with a heart 
Plus I have multiple um, autoimmune diseases, which just complicate everything that goes on for me. So it's, it's a challenge. You know, I've, I've got a, a rheumatology appointment that I've been waiting for already several months and it's not going to happen until November. And so I, you know, I've got, I've got to deal with a lot of, a lot of setbacks because of, of COVID and, you know, who knows what, what monkey pox or any of these other things are going to do, you know, it's, but it's, it, it has created a bit of a problem. So I've had to step back and I can't work as much as I would like to. Um, and it's just because of fatigue and pain. I, I can't, can't shake the, the, the chronic pain that I have through my body and the, the fatigue that comes with these autoimmune diseases is really just unbearable. I never, I never really understood chronic fatigue and chronic pain. You know, I've, I've always had a high threshold for pain and I could, you know, go with very little sleep, but this is, this is different than being tired. It's, it's just an exhaustion where your body just can't continue to go on. Isn't this the result of your service in the military? Yeah, I, I was exposed to toxic chemicals and it, it just messed with my body system and caused me to develop a whole lot of autoimmune diseases. I've got, you know, inflamed heart. I've got, you know, so now I got a new heart, which is great, but it's starting to affect my my new heart now. So there's something real, real invasive with this, you know, that once it gets in there and it, you know, causes your body to to be disrupted and particularly in its autoimmune system, it's, it's really just a, a matter of time before all your organs start to to get affected and you know i was i was supposed to have a liver transplant um but when i uh i refused to get the the covid vaccine because of all my my medical conditions and you know i have some issues with that so i i said i wasn't going to do it and when i chose not to do it they they said well you're not going to be a candidate for a liver transplant then that is so wrong yeah they told my husband that on lung transplant too yeah. You can't get on the list if you don't get the shot. And that's just wrong. Yeah, especially when, you know, I, I mean, I see how, how it's affecting people and causing very the very conditions I already have had and continue to have. I, I'm like, well, I just don't want to exasperate anything else with, with, with something that, you know, here I am with no immune system and I haven't caught COVID, but I'm, you know, go to the, to the Mayo Clinic quite often. And I'm, I mean, I'm there several times a month and yet I, uh, haven't caught it yet. So, you know, maybe there's something in my, in my DNA that I'm not, I'm, maybe I'm immune to it. Who knows? Because I've been around people who've had it and I haven't got it. But I think, you know, I just put my trust and faith in God. I know that if that's the way he wants me to die, then I'll get it and, and I'll die or I'll get it and recover. But I'm not worried about it. God, let me come back. He, you know, he has a plan for me and I, that plan is going to unfold exactly the way that he wants it to. And you know, if, if, if the liver is something that goes, so be it. But I'm, I'm less concerned about the liver as I am the heart, you know, or my lungs, because the liver can regenerate. I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. And my liver has, since that point when they said I needed a transplant has actually gotten a little bit better. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty positive about it. Good. Has a lot of veterans come I don't want to say down with this, like it's an illness, but have they got this? Yeah, there's, well? you know, they categorize it as the Gulf War illness. Oh. So there's there's quite a, a few veterans. And, you know, it seems as if every era of veterans has these mysterious diseases. And, you know, it's, it, it's pretty bizarre because, you know, we come from all over the country, you know, and actually all over the world. There's people who, who join our military and they serve for three years and they get citizenship. So... There's a lot of people who who come from all over the place and we regular are rigorously tested medically before we come in so we're all healthy you know they don't let people come in who have diseases that that are going to cause issues like this so they test us thoroughly and then for us to come down these high percentages through all the different eras you know you got the vietnam vets with the agent orange and you know you got the gulf war illness and then now you've got you know the depleted uranium and the burn pits, you know, they, they want to blame the burn pits, but it's the depleted uranium and all the other chemicals that they expose veterans to, plus these inoculations that, you know, do disrupt the, the natural immune system. These things are causing havoc on, on people's bodies. And, you know, it's, it's, it's no way to know exactly which part of it is causing it. 
But when you're exposed to so many chemicals and your immune system has to flare up to try to try to combat that, it, it taxes it. I don't know if it just wears it down to where now it's not effective or or what, but it's, you know, my autoimmune system, it overreacts. So now it doesn't have a, a way to, to, to dial back. It just attacks everything. And so it attacks my own, my own body. And that's really what it's doing is it's just eating my own body up. It's crazy. Yeah, it's weird to, to you know to think your own body you're killing yourself. You know, it's just it's kind of a bizarre concept to sit back with, and particularly when it already has killed me once. You know, it's it's almost like having a a, a time bomb or a death sentence on you. But but you know, it's it is it's wonderful for me because I've had that assurance of going to heaven, and seeing God, and knowing that He allowed me to come back. I just feel really bad for other people, you know, and veterans, friends of mine, you know, people that are are suffering with different autoimmune diseases and and they don't have that that same, you know, same connection with God or the same faith. A lot of them have strong faith. So I'm not I'm not saying they don't have strong faith, but but it's that that realization of what I have from actually seeing God face to face. That gives me a lot of comfort, you know, and so I, I really feel bad for the people who who are struggling and and having to do, deal with the, these systems, or these issues without without the proper uh, proper support from the medical system right now. Without the proper support from the medical system right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's everybody knows about the VA. It's you you don't you know you don't really want to go to the VA if you don't have to because it's it's just you know it's a poorly run organization. Um, they do their best. The people that are there, there's some really good people there. I, I worked at the VA, so I, I know I put my whole effort into it. But it's it's a very difficult bureaucracy to work within. And, you know, the, to see the suicide rate for veterans, you know, that's it's just astronomical. It's it's well above the national average. So it's there's something clearly going on and it doesn't get the proper attention that it deserves. And somebody who like me who works in the in the psychology field, you know, actually working with people and helping them to prevent suicide to, to, to the experience that I had to have of having my hands held behind my back. So I couldn't really help these people that needed it, particularly the fact that they were combat veterans, you know, people I'm really, really connected with that that hurt. That was a really tough realization, you know, going into a kind of with rose colored glasses, thinking I was going to, you know, help all these guys. And, and then seeing that the bureaucracy itself was keeping me from doing it. Not the fact that we didn't have the ability to do it because we did. It was the bureaucracy, the, the political infighting and all, all that, the policies that they make, those, those put a lot of barriers up to actually getting the help to the people. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that could be fixed. And I think that's what we need to work on because there's just too many people that are, you know, I, I think COVID opened our eyes to how, how crazy the whole system is, is that people are dying from things that, that we were actually seeing a decrease in beforehand, but we, we have to have more of an intelligent and open dialogue about how we treat people because everybody's bodies respond a little bit differently to things. And if we try to do a cookie cutter approach to things, more people are going to die. And, and it just can't be done. We have to be able to take and look at the individual. If we don't take the individual seriously, then then we're doing a disservice to all of humanity. I've had my fair share of rose-colored glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and when they come off, it's not pretty. <laughs> yeah, no. It's almost as if you'd like to keep them on. But, you know, truth is something that I'm after. I always want truth, you know, and I, I'd much rather have my rose colored glasses slapped off me so I can see the ugly truth. And then I can maybe start to do something with it because I'm not afraid to roll up my sleeves and work. It's just unfortunate that often the, the, the people or the perpetrators behind the ugliness, they like it that way because it serves some, some need or some benefit that they, they get. And, you know, it's, I'm still not afraid to, to stand up and do the fight. I, I don't mind getting into it. But it's it's difficult when it's kept from everyone else, because if we if we were all able to, to stand up and say, hey, this isn't right, more things would be done. You know, and as a community, we need to be able to stand by each other and help each other and also not 
you know, at the same time, not fall into the, to the ideas that the one size fits all. And we're all going to have to do things this one particular way, because that just, that's not reality. It, it's never been reality. And we've, we've got to be able to take the individual and, and look at how, how it's affecting them and in order to be able to help each other. I think if they could prove near death experiences or take them seriously enough to investigate them, that there could be a lot of healing just yeah. like you've had just by the knowledge that this is real. This is where we're going. And this is how we need to be living our lives because it does matter. We I can't agree. just go do whatever we want and heck with everybody else and think we're going to get, um, go to heaven free ticket. No. Yeah. You know, I I've seen some, some new research out there like UCLA and a couple other major universities are doing some pretty good research on it. And, you know, they're finding that these, these experiences are happening from doctors just don't ask about it. You know, none of my doctors asked me about it. I talked to one doctor about it, but it was only because she cared to ask me about how I was doing after I died. Believe it or not, all these different medical professionals that I've gone to from different specialties. I mean, with all the autoimmune diseases, they affect all my different organs. So I've had to see, you know, doctors of every kind of, of specialty from cancer all the way down to, you, you know, to, to rheumatology and, and everything in between. But only one doctor ever asked me, Hey, how are you doing about with your, with your dying? You know, how did that affect you spiritually? And how did it affect you mentally? You know, are you okay? You know, and only one doctor out of yeah. hundreds. So none of the other doctors want to do that. What they do is they, and this isn't to bad mouth doctors. It's just part of the way that their profession is set up is they look at the system. But when you look at a system, you're looking at like the heart, but you forget that that heart is connected to a whole human body, you know? And yeah, you, you care a little bit about how it's affecting the other organs and things, but it's a systems focus. And to be a good doctor, you really have to take a look at the whole human being. And so I've had one doctor who did that, but that ha- had more doctors asked about it, I think they would have been very surprised to, to learn that I had a near-death experience. But what, what kind of world would that open up for them when they're helping healing other patients? You know, so when you see yeah. these other universities doing it, you know that good things are going to come out of it because they're going to carry some clout with them and bringing that research forward to the rest of their professionals. And I wish there'd be more awareness about if you're an organ donor, what actually happens when you are faced with a life threatening situation like my tubal pregnancy i was in the basement and they got did an ultrasound and saw the internal bleeding finally the surgery room was just right down the hall in the basement but but because i was an organ donor they sent me back upstairs in a room and had me sign each organ away. It was like you were uh, just bought a fifty thousand dollar or five hundred thousand dollar home. You know, all the paperwork at a bank. That's what it was like signing all these organs away. I was twenty five years old, I yeah. had three kids at home, and I'm up here signing. You know, I wait. I called my doctor all week. Said something's wrong, and he wouldn't believe me. I go to the emergency room. I die in the hallway. Have this heaven experience. Too embarrassed and to tell them, but I said, I'm not going home because I want my kids to find me dead. So they left me home. I died all through the night. And then they finally, I said, God, just let me stay alive till morning. Maybe my doctor will come in early, do an ultrasound, find out, you know, before I die here. And that's what happened. Finally, 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 right? They find the problem. It's internal bleeding. The biggest tool of pregnancy they ever saw. And, but instead of rushing me to surgery, they put me upstairs to sign these papers. But then after they were done signing the papers, I was, I was mad. I said, don't you have a paper that says just take it all? And she says, no, we got to do this. And the nurse wasn't nice. I mean, there was no sympathy on her face. This young girl's dying. You know, I find I find out later that um, during that time, they called my whole family and said I wasn't going to make it. So I felt like they put me in this room just to die because they wanted my young organs instead of rushing me down the hall and give me the daggone surgery. And so I sat there, you know, just angry. You know, they just let me sit there in this room. Yeah. Like time's going by, get me in surgery. You know, of course, obviously they finally took me down and did it. But um, since then, I've talked to a few other people, you know, a car wreck or different situations and they're brought in the emergency room and they hear the doctor's nurses saying, this person isn't going to make it. And they put them in a room by themselves yeah. instead of rushing and saving their life 
they leave them and they they're working on the paper called organ donation they're they're calling the people that's going to get the organs and and you're laying there like this meat hmm. with this realization that you don't get a chance to tell the world because most i'm so you know most die and they take their organs but like people like me that have experienced it and didn't die it's like, you know, wow, these rose collared glasses are off about organ donation. I thought I was doing a really good thing when I put on my driver's license organ donator, right? But then when you're actually in that position, and people don't talk about it, you know, we're talking about, you know, medical field and, and where they, they lack, and, and we all lack, and, and we all can improve in things, but it's just one of those things that they need to come up with something to where that doesn't happen to people. If you're an organ donor, fine, you're an organ donor. Deal with that after the person's gone. Okay. Don't get in a hurry to make all this money as a hospital and all these other things to save all these other lives because those are your parts. Yeah. If there's a chance to save your life, that should be number one. Right. Yeah, it, you know, it's, and, and it's, it's tricky because, like, even on the other side of it, you know, you, you have to have, for me, I, you know, I had a heart transplant, so I have to, to think about the, the person all the time who I got that heart from. Oh, see, I didn't want th I'm sorry, I didn't think of that yeah. when I was saying that. No, no, I, but I, I totally get what you're saying because, you know, I often, you know, I heard a lot of things about how China is doing organ harvesting. And, you know, I, I would hate to have had something like that happen where they took somebody's heart, you know, that, that my, my person was dead. They were, they were legally dead. They had them on life support. So, you know, that was, that's how right. that worked for me. So, I, but and there's but no coming back from that. No, the brain dead. No back from right. Yeah, they're brain dead. So there was, you know, that's for me ethically. That that's how I would have wanted. I couldn't take a, a heart any other way. But you know, when you th when you think about how much money it does go into, it, I mean, it's a million and a half dollars for a heart tramp. You know, to get a heart. So I mean, it's it, it's spendy. You know, and yeah, and, and that's somebody's making a lot of money because you know the. the the doctor who did the surgery, fantastic. I can't believe he could operate. It was like a 10 hour operation. I mean, that's, I, I don't know how, how you're going to stand for 10 hours working on such a delicate organ. You know, it's, it's, it's wonderful that he had that kind of skill and talent, but I don't think they paid him a million and a half dollars for it. Right. He, he gets a good salary. I'm sure. I mean, he's probably making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, but still, it, there's there's a lot of money that's 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 out there and you know somebody's making that money and it goes to that bureaucracy that whole driving force you know that even the doctors have to operate under and you know that's why i, I try not to badmouth the doctors too much although i do think that they should stand up a little bit more but when i was working at the va i found the bureaucracy to be the hardest problem it was a lot of top-down instructions they don't even know what's going on on the ground level at in the top you know they i was under I mean, they came into my hot, my room in the hospital every single time. They have groups of people coming in and studying me. And not all of them were doctors and, you know, interns and, you know, fellows. They, they weren't all medical professionals. There was a lot of hospital bureaucracy that would come in and, and take. But they were talking. They never talked to me. You know, they, they would sit there and talk to themselves and point out things. <laughs> but they can't, they're not getting the whole story. They're not really understanding things. They weren't talking to the doctors at the time who were actually working on me. So they're, they're evaluating things from a distance, not from getting right in there and understanding what the real process is, you know? And so there's a problem with that. And that's where that money is going is they're dictating who's going to pocket that money. And, you know, it's, it's a real thing when you think about, you know, people worrying about whether they're going to, they're going to be killed because they are an organ, organ donor. And, you know, that's, I think that probably is why it took me two years to, to get an organ. You know, it's, it's, it's something that, that comes into it, you know, living in the Midwest, there's not a, a lot of options for, for an organ. You know, they had to have me go down to, to Phoenix to, to be able to be so much more, you know, the highly densely pop populated cities, you know, and, so you have like a four hour time frame to get the organ from the, the donor into the, to the recipient. So, I mean, it's, it's tough, you know, you live next door to North Dakota and South Dakota and, you know, Iowa and Wisconsin, you, you just don't have a lot of cities that you can pull from in that, that four hour time frame, you know, or four hour radius. So it's, it's really and, tough. And the thought of, you know, China harvesting the organs and I've, 
watch stuff that talk about, you know, taken from prisoners. Yeah. And their prisoners aren't real criminals. They're usually right. political prisoners who just dissent against the, the evil regime of the Communist Party. And, you know, I, I sure wish that we would do a lot more to help those people. They uh, they need our help. And yet, you know, we're kind of driven to, to help help the certain elite elements of the world rather than to help the, the poorest of the poor. And that's a really sad thing. Yeah, we're messed up. That's for sure. And then, you know, aborted baby hair from their scalp put on mice. I mean, Pennsylvania like under Island. Fauci. Yeah, he's like Dr. Moreau. That, they're going to make a movie about that guy someday. And, you know, it's going to be a horror movie because the, the things that he has done in his whole career, it's just. Who is it? Dr. Fauci. Oh, Fauci. Yeah. Yeah. He's like Dr. Moreau. He's He's just. He's just a megalomaniac, and he, I, I don't know how he has swindled the American public into thinking he's a good guy, but he's he's just a nefarious little little man who has that little man syndrome. He just has to try to control as much as he can get his hands on. It just seems like it shows how uneducated our population is. Sorry, my cat's doing something here. Um, for people to be so gullible to yeah, what they're it, falling for it's that group thing you know sometimes you know particularly when there's fear you know people people didn't know what to expect from covid you know and 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 part of it is there's such a there's such a goodness that it, that we have to recognize is that people wanted to help and prevent this from going to other people that's a good thing i i I, I say that's a wonderful virtue to try to help other people however when we get to the point where we say Oh, we're going to help all these people and if you don't listen we're going to force you you're no longer helping you're you're part of the problem as well you're and controlling we have, to have we have to have our rational thinking about us we can't just fall in and accept something because one person is saying to do this and then when they backtrack on it we've got to really hold them accountable because they can't say science has changed they always said follow the science now they're saying science has changed and is, they're changing all these regulations and all these guidances mm -hmm. You know, science doesn't change. It's it's the approach or the interpretation of the science has changed. But that means there was error. If the interpretation of science has changed, that means they came into it with an error. And we have to correct that. And that means some people probably need to lose their jobs because they were wrong. You know, and if they're wrong and they're saying, we are absolutely right, we're going to do this, and you cost people their lives because of your inerrant practices and protocols, you got to be held accountable. If, if I was responsible for a suicide and I didn't do my job properly and somebody committed suicide, I'm going to lose my license. They're never going to let me practice again. But yet, yeah. go ahead. You know, hey, Dr. Fauci, you, you know, we're not even going to slap you on the wrist. We're going to pay you your big, huge salary and let you continue on down the path until you will decide to retire right before, you know, a uh, possible political change. That's that's something that people should really question. People should open their eyes and say that something's fishy with them. You know, you don't have to say he's fully responsible. I don't even care if they totally admit it. The fact is he didn't make mistakes and those mistakes cost lives. And that that's the bottom line. We can't just let people who get to run the show cost people their lives. Yeah. I remember working as a, a child abuse investigator in West Virginia and the girl in the office next to me, a uh, boss come in one day and said, did you tell this woman that was very overweight not to sleep with her newborn child? Uh, no, you're fired because she rolled over on the child in her sleep mm. and the child died. You know, we have consequences. Yes, but, absolutely. But yet there's so much. And then, you know, as everybody knows, we're, you know, what is it, 75 years before anybody can sue if this yeah, yeah has caused a problem and we can't even say the word you and i or they won't even put this video on <laughs> yeah it's, it's unbelievable i mean you go to the, to the military oh even like I, I see these commercials for camp lejeune you know it's like from 1950 to 1987 if you served in this time you may be eligible because the contaminated drinking water now 
I want to know who wasn't testing that water the whole time to make sure it wasn't contaminated. That's a huge issue. We can, we test our water. I mean, we're always told our waters are safe. You know, I get a report every every year or every couple of years and what the water levels are in my community. I'm assuming everybody else does too, because it's it's said that it's a federal mandate to do so. But for some reason, in certain areas, they're not doing that. So you got these guys from Camp Lejeune who are all experiencing cancer and all kinds of other different diseases because of contaminated drinking water, but it only goes to 1987. These guys are probably, most of them are dead at this point. You know, this is such an unfair thing that they finally, once they say, okay, enough of them are done. It's like they're ta- taking a bunch of actuaries and saying, well, let's, let's do some math here and figure out what this is going to cost us. Well, we got to wait till, you know, 2022, then most of them will be dead and we can go ahead and then start paying out. Because that's, you know, that's that's the real problem is that it comes down to the financial cost. They don't care about human life. And that's where we got to hold them accountable because human life is dear. All human life is valuable. I don't care if it's a veteran who's old and he's, he's suffering from some illness. His life is valuable. If it's a homeless person, his life is valuable. If it's if it's some mom who's got a who's got a, a tough pregnancy, her life is valuable. You know, all life is valuable and we have to stand by that and say, we will not draw a line on life. Life is valuable. We are going to protect all of life. Yeah. And, and one- you know, just like the, say the Parkland shooter, look at the whole long trial, everything he's getting because his life is at stake, whether he gets life in prison or the death penalty, look at all they're going through for his life. Yeah. But then so many other lives it just don't matter. Yeah. It's it, most of us are, you know, in the military, I knew I was expendable. You know, it's if you if you die, you die. That's part of the deal. You kind of know that going in. You don't expect that it's going to catch up with you later on in life. You know, once you get out of the military, you served your time. You're like, well, you know, I, I made it. I'm I'm OK. And then years later, it kills you. That's that's a real issue. That's and that's what I'm you know, I'm 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 fearful for our communities now is that People have, have fallen kind of lockstep into a certain protocol and many years from now, they may die because of the choice that they were, they were led to believe was, was the best one to make, but they weren't given all the information. And that's how it is in the military. They don't tell you what you're taking. They force you to take it. You know, I, I didn't, I had, didn't have a choice whether I took shots when I was in the military, they said private, take your shot, and move out. And it's threatening because you know that you can be article 15 and thrown in prison for that. You know, and, and even now with the vaccine, yeah, they had to, they'd have a choice. Yeah. A lot of people had no choice and, you know, I'm glad a lot of people stood up for it. I mean, you hear about some of these nurses that, that stood up and now they're suing and, you know, more lawsuits are probably going to come because the, the way things were done, we were lied to. And, you know, you can't lie to us. It's, people are, are intelligent enough to make their own decision. You have to let them make it, but if you tell people, yeah, there's, there's some risk to this, you know, we're going to try to minimize the risk. We're going to try to work with it. We're going to treat you. If we do have some, some side effects, we're going to treat you properly, but we need you to take this because we really believe this is the best option. They would have got more people to follow along with this, but the, 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 the forcing people to do something, there's a, a high percentage of people who will never respond to force. You know, I think of like Gandhi, man, that guy, he didn't have physical strength. But boy, did he have a, a spiritual strength. I mean, his 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 body inside, his soul was so strong that he kept getting up and getting beat down. And he says, I won't, I won't bend. I will not let you break me. You will not do these things. It's wrong. And the other side had to say, you know what? I can't do this. It's inhuman to, to beat somebody who's not fighting back. You know, but it's it's that that spirit that just won't give in. And there's a lot of people who are never going to do that. So if you try to force people, that's the wrong tactic. But it's 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 revealing an ugly head that we have in our government that there's people there who want to force us to do something. Yeah, you know? and the and, censorship. Yeah. You can't Google and find answers to to political things now because they only put out one side. Yeah, yeah. It's it's might as well just live in communist China. It seems like they're running the show. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're the best at it. And, 
they're poor people. I, I feel so bad for their population. You know, ever since I was a little kid, Tiananmen Square always, always stuck out to me. You know, that's, that's one of the big reasons I wanted to join the military is I wanted to stand up for people who couldn't stand up for themselves. You know, never once were we ever sent over to China. We act like they're our buddies, they're our friends, and they're not. That, that, that government is evil. It's no different different than Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot. You know, Mao, he was an evil man. He started an evil regime. And this is the fruits of it. So we've got to call it out. He, that, that whole regime is responsible for killing hundreds of millions of people. That's, that's worse than Hitler. That's, it's crazy when you put it into that perspective. We need to stand up like we did against Hitler and stop this, this evil from happening because those people are being tortured. Yeah. Yeah. Something's going to happen eventually. You know, yeah, but, we're going to stand for things for so long. Well, you know, it's crazy when you think of like how people used to be all about free Tibet. You know, I'm still about that. I still want to free Tibet. But it seems as if even our, our Hollywood elites, they don't even care about Tibet anymore. You know, it's almost as if they just have said, well, forget Tibet. We've been told different orders. Let's, let's fo focus on something else. You know, those people are still suffering. They're still under the communist regime. You know, how do we forget about people that we say we're never going to forget about? There's something wrong with that mentality when we shift our focus from what is right. And we have to always say, this is happening. It's wrong. We're not going to bend on it. We have to be resolute in our decisions. Yeah. Well, I thank you for your time. We yeah. certainly didn't know where this conversation was going to go when we started. <laughs> I didn't expect this. <laughs> I'm sorry. My animals been making so much noise. If it's not the dogs barking, it's the cats fighting, <laughs> playing. <laughs> but um, was there anything you wanted to cover that? You know, I just want, I just want people to know that, you know, God is out there. You know, he's, he loves us. He's got a plan for us. And, and really all we have to do is pick up, pick up our cross really and follow him, whatever it is we have in our life, you know, not everybody's going to have a heart transplant. Not everybody has to go through that extreme thing, but sometimes just sacrificing what we think is best for us in order that somebody else gets something that's, that's better. You know, it's, it's even, you know, you could, you're going to a restaurant, let's say your, your husband, he asks you, well, let's go to a restaurant. Sometimes it's okay to say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna let you choose, honey. You know, it's it, today you go ahead and choose sacrificing something small on, on a regular basis can add so much joy to the world. But those, those are little crosses that we get to bear because we're, we're sacrificing ourselves. We're denying our own, our own self-interest, you know, and that's really what, what's important. And our purpose in life is to share God's love. And in order to do that, we have to deny ourselves because we are, are our own worst enemies. Often we always want what's best for us and not, thinking about what's good for our neighbor in the process. In order to have, have a healthy, happy existence in this world, we've got to let God take charge. We've got to put him in the right order. And when we do, we benefit our neighbors and our lives increase. It's so much better to do something for somebody else. I love doing things for people. Giving gifts is a great example. When you give somebody a gift that you really put your, your thoughts into and you knew you were going to get them something that they love, you love to see the joy on their face. That's better than getting a gift yourself. It, it, it is the gift. So when we can do that on a regular basis by helping our, our fellow man to have a better life or at least a better moment in their life, then we're doing something good. Yeah, and we know what is good when it makes us feel good. Absolutely. You know, uh, getting doesn't revenge feel good. doesn't feel good. No, it always disturbs your inner peace and, and it never will be satisfying. You know, it's it's something that that anger might drive you towards and you think that it feels good, but you're basing it off of an emotion. Emotion cannot satisfy you. Yeah. And if that you find that satisfying, you know, you just crossed over to a side you yeah. never wanted to be on. <laughs> yeah. You're on the dark side. You might as well just sign up with Darth Vader. <laughs> you're going the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Brian. It's nice seeing you again and talking to you and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Peggy. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye. -bye. Bye.